So welcome uh, to the tree committees. Uh, we, every year we do an educational seminar, and this is our one this year. And came about when Anna and Mike were doing a survey for places to plant trees in town, and they noticed that so many of the pine trees were looking pretty bad, and said, hey, we need somebody to come in, because we all kind of look at each other and go, I don't know much about it. And so, and when Ann and I or others of us get called out, sometimes it's a pine tree issue and it's just like, I always feel so bad because I don't know what to tell people because it's just not something I'm familiar with. There's plenty of seats. So we decided to bring in a speaker to let us all get informed. We might as well have a lot more people informed about pine trees and uh, conifers is what they officially are. So we asked Curtis Young, who is from Van Wert County. He is the Education and Natural Resources Coordinator, agent, whatever. And um, so anyway, he knows a lot about trees. He also knows about fungi. And we found out that he also has a, a real interest in dragonflies and uh, damselflies. So if you have any questions about any of those things, too, he can also get you informed. So I'll let Curtis take over from here. Okay. At least. Very good. Thanks. Um, and I am an entomologist by training, so um, my master's and PhD are both in entomology. Uh, but if you're dealing with insects, you're dealing with every other living organism out there because everything has bugs no matter what you're looking at. <coughs> Not every conifer is a pine. And it is important to understand that because all of the diseases and insects that hit conifers don't necessarily hit every type of conifer that is out there. So the very first thing that we always have to do is identify what is the tree that we are dealing with. So during the program here, as far as we get through it, before you shut me out the door and cut me off, um, we will try to look at some of the more commonly encountered problems with the conifers or the evergreens review aspects of their biology, and review possible management schemes if it's feasible, short of basal pruning with a chainsaw at soil level, to deal with these types of problems. What do we mean when we say conifer? What is a conifer? Well, you've already told me it's a pine, but I've also told you not every conifer is a pine tree. Also in that list, and also very common in our landscapes throughout the state of Ohio, are the spruce trees. And they all belong to the same family, the Pinaceae. However, the subfamilies underneath there are going to divide them out into different genera, such as the, um, uh, the pi Pinus, Picea, and Abies, which are the pines, the spruces, and the firs. That's the other thing that you'll hear somebody saying, oh, my fir tree's looking bad. And you go out in the yard and think, I don't see a fir tree anywhere, when they're referring to their spruce or they're referring to their pine. Uh, so it is important to keep them straight. So that's a pine. And it's a, a nicely shaped, uh, a pyramidal uh, type of pine tree. Um, that one is Austrian pine. It's a long needled, two needled pine. Uh, that's a spruce. That's the Colorado blue spruce. So the question is, how do you tell the difference between that pine that has that pyramidal conical shape and that spruce that has that pyramidal conical shape? Um, that, the shape doesn't tell you exactly what you're dealing with. So you have to get down to some more specifics, such as how are the needles presented on that tree? And, and so the true pines, the ones that belong to the pinus genus, have all of their needles presented in bundles of two, three, or five. And so you see this is a two-needle pine here. Happens to be Virginia pine, pinus virginiana. Uh, virginiana. Um, and so you can see out of a common point of that branch, two needles come out. That Austrian pine is a two-needle pine. So every place that needles come out of the branch, there will be two needles on those. Eastern white pine, that real beautiful, soft, um, easy to work around tree, is a five-needle pine. So every place that the needles come out of the branch, there are clusters of five needles. Now, when it comes to three-needle pines, it's a little less common to encounter them. 
Uh, but things such as loblolly pine, ponderosa pine, uh, pit lolly pine produces their needles in groups of three. So if you find multiple needles in either two, three, or five, you know immediately it is a true pine. On the other hand, the spruces, when you look down close to the branch and look down in here, you will see that each needle is presented individually on the branch. In addition to that, when you look down here at the base of that needle, there's actually kind of a wooden peg-like structure that that needle sits on. And whenever the needle falls off of a spruce tree, that wooden peg-like structure is left behind. So if you pick up a dead spruce branch and run your fingers down the branch, it's going to be really rough because of all of those little wooden pegs that have been left behind. So again, pines <coughs> present their needles in bundles. Spruces present their needles individually on pegs. And if you look at that needle, you could roll that needle between your fingers. However, it would go chunk, 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 chunk as it rolls because a spruce needle is square. It has four sides. So that's the spruce. But those aren't the only pines. They're the most common ones, the most common conifers that we're going to encounter, but they're not the only ones. Because there are the true firs. And firs are different than spruces and pines. There are the junipers, the arborvitae, the yews or taxes, the hemlocks. And if we look at, look at examples of that, it is a fir. Now, how can you tell that difference between that fir and that spruce tree that we saw a few slides ago? Well, you have to look at the needles once again, because the needles are presented differently on firs than they are on spruces. They are individually presented. You can't roll them between your fingers, because they're flat. They're basically two-sided. <coughs> and where they connect to the branch, Instead of a little wooden peg that they sit on, it's more like a suction cup adhering it to the branch. And whenever those needles fall off the branch, the branch is basically smooth. So there are IV characteristics that we can look for. Junipers. These are the things that grow wild beside the highway. And we call them red cedar. <laughs> And it's not a cedar. It is a juniper. It's Juniperus virginiana, another Virginia name in there. Uh, so that's a, a juniper, even though we call it red cedar. And that's the tree, when it's big enough, can be harvested for making cedar boards that we put into cedar chests. Now that's the tree it comes from. So. The wood tends to have some white area on the outside of the di diameter of the trunk, and it's really red toward the center of it, and it gives off that very cedar scent that you're familiar with, with your blanket box or your sweater box that is a true cedar chest. And when we look at the needles on that eastern red cedar, or juniper, um, the youngest needles, those needles that are produced on a very young plant, are described as being awl-like, like an awl that you poke holes with. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can see these are really sharp and pointy. But as that tree ages and gets older growth on it, the needles are more of a scale-like needle that overlap on top of one another, and it's relatively round around the diameter uh, or the circumference of those needles. And what are these structures here? <laughs> we call them berries. Uh, inappropriately, we call them berries. It is the cone of the eastern red cedar. And if you take those berry-like structures, those cones, there are seeds inside of them, and you crush that between your fingers and smell, you're going to get a very distinct odor to it. Anybody know what that odor smells like? Yeah. 
Jim. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jim. So we know who's... No, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the fruit that we use to flavor gin, is the berry off of juniper trees. And so it does very distinctly smell like gin. Uh, then we go to the arborvitae. The arborvitae, the ever-present arborvitae. You can't go anywhere without running into arborvitae. And you know what the other common name to arborvitae is? White cedar. And once again, it's not a cedar. It's an arborvitae. Its, it's genus name is Thuya. Um, Thuya occidentalis is the native northern white cedar. Uh, and it's very, very common. Uh, the needles on the arbor body tend to be a flat spray or fan-like structure. Also with overlapping needles, but those overlapping needles are flat in comparison to the juniper, which is round when it's overlapping like that. And there's the cones of the arbor body. And they're pretty small, pretty, um, you know, most of the time people look right past them because they blend in right with the rest of the shrub. Now, there are other types of arborvitae that we use in our landscapes that are from other countries, but this is our native arborvitae here. Uh, and from there, we have taxis. Uh, most of it is English taxis that we brought over from Europe. Uh, and that is the seed producing structure on taxis. Uh, and it's called a fleshy arrow cup. And inside of there, is the seed of there. You can see it sticking out right there. You can see the seed. Now, the, the Chinese will eat those. They eat those. Um, and I, I'm, I'm holding back not to call it a fruit because only flowering plants produce true fruits. This is a gymnosperm. It's not an angiosperm. And so that's a fleshy um, receptacle, basically, that swells around the seed as it's developing. That fleshy part is edible. Don't eat the seed. The seed is toxic. So you suck the fleshiness off the outside and spit the seed out. Um, now, there is a Pacific axis, or a Pacific U, that grows out on the coastline of California and Oregon and Washington. And do you know what that's used for? Breast cancer. There is a breast cancer chemical treatment called Taxol. And Taxol comes from a taxis, a U, the, specifically the Pacific U. Okay? And I have to say that fairly carefully as well. Spit, I don't want to spit on the audience in front here. But um, so we have a flat needled uh, type of uh, conifer plant as well. Uh, and then uh, another common one, you probably get more of these down this direction than what I have further north. This is a hemlock. And hemlocks have a relatively short single needle attached to the branches. And when we get a little closer, you can see they kind of go in a whirl all the way around the branch. It's connected by a little bit of a petiole, small cones on the, the hemlock. Um, they're a very soft tree, another one easy to work around because of they're not sharp and pointy like a, a spruce tree may be. So those are some of the common uh, conifers. Then over here we have three additional ones, the Douglas fir, and notice how I put the name there. There's a hyphen there, Douglas fir. It's because it is not a true fir. <laughs> So when you look at the needle attachment of the needles on Douglas fir, if it were a true fir, it would have a little suction cup. On this, it's just a petiole like a hemlock. In fact, its genus name is Pseudo-Suga. And hemlock is Suga. Pseudo means false hemlock. Now when we look at um, the needles of of the Douglas fir. There's not a suction <coughs> up there. Um, but the cone is the identifier of Douglas fir. It is one of the most unique cones that we have out there. 
Um, and these cones dangle downwards when they're mature, and they have these almost snake-like tongues that stick out of the cone, or bracts is what they're called. Um, and Douglas fir is the only one that has that. Uh, the other thing when we, I didn't mention back with the true firs, when the true fir produces its cone, it points upwards. And it stays that way through maturity. Has anybody ever picked up a fir cone off of the ground? Nope. It's because that cone disintegrates on the tree. These, these structures that make up the cone are called scales, um, cone scales. Uh, on the true firs, those scales fall off the central stalk of the cone, and all you're left with up in the tree is a stalk sticking up in the air, and the seeds and the scales just trickle down through the tree to the ground. So you don't find intact fir cones on the ground. You can find pine cones on the ground, you can find spruce cones on the ground, you can find Douglas fir cones on the ground, but not true firs. Then we have things such as bald cypress. And I kind of have an affinity for bald cypress, but for a couple of reasons. Now, one reason is they are a very versatile tree. They can be used in some of the most severe habitats that you can imagine from very droughty soils to very flooded soils. Mm -hmm. And they are a fantastic street tree. They can grow in those street lawns that we expect trees to grow in, and they can thrive in those street lawns. Uh, and the other semi-unique characteristic about the bald cypress, it is not an evergreen. It's deciduous. It drops its needles every year, which has unfortunately led to a few of their demises when a new homeowner comes into a home in the middle of summer and they see their evergreen drop all its needles. It must have died. Break out the chainsaw. Zing, right at basal height. Um, the, but the other unique characteristic about the bald cypress are these structures that are called knees. Um, and they will produce these when the soil is saturated. Uh, and they're actually almost periscopes for the roots to acquire oxygen so that they can survive. So these bald cypress trees are growing in standing water constantly and survive perfectly well. But they can also survive very droughty soils. And then the other one here, um, which is kind of a, a majestic tree, and this is a fairly young one still, that is the Dawn Redwood. And the Dawn Redwood is becoming more and more available um, through nurseries and other areas. Um, but the uniqueness of the Dawn Redwood is we thought it was extinct. We thought it was extinct until it was discovered in a valley in China. Once China opened its doors to the outside world, botanists found a couple of different things. Not only uh, Dawn Redwood, but also the ginkgo tree. Um, ginkgo and bald cypress, or uh, Dawn Redwood at one time, covered most of the land mass of the world. But as the land mass changed and climates changed, they died off and were pushed back and pushed back. We know ginkgos were here millions of years ago based on the fossil record. We find ginkgo leaves in coal all the time. But until China reopened its doors to the rest of the world, we didn't know it still survived. And now, it's a relatively common <coughs> street tree. And it's very closely related to the pines, the spruces, and the firs. It's a gymnosperm as well. And this is the feathery, needle-like structure of the Don Redwood. Um, and all of this falls off the tree on an annual basis. And so um, those are the two deciduous conifers that we have. 
And this is what it looks like right now. It's turning this reddish brown, rusty color. You can drive around any village, city, or neighborhood, and you can start spotting the either bald cypress or the dawn redwoods based on this coloration. <coughs> and then by um, the end of December, all of that needle mass will be off. And it'll, it, it, they actually have very pretty structure to them, even when they don't have their needle structure on the, the rest of the tree. It's one that I recommend frequently. Hopefully not so frequently that it becomes monoculture like they <coughs> frequently do. But um, for very diverse habitats, both the Don Redwood and the Bald Cypress um, do very well in, in urban landscapes. All right, so what is the native habitat of our conifers? And this is one of the things that we have to think about whenever we're trying to understand why are our conifers sometimes declining and uh, falling, you know, falling to pieces? Well, the first thing we have to remember is where did they evolve? Where were they uh, adapted to? What habitat do our conifers come from? Any idea? North. Well, um, we could say north, uh, but it's more than just north. I'm sorry, and they are adapted to coldness. So coldness, they are adapted to and survive fairly well under um, pretty cold temperatures. Mountains. Now Colorado blue spruce. What's in Colorado? The Rocky Mountains. Um, and most of our conifers are adapted to a fairly moist soil, but very well drained soil. And so you know, when we try to take these conifers that are adapted to mountainsides that have uh, fairly good drainage on them and relatively shallow soils and then throw them into our heavy clay soils of Ohio and wonder why they crap out, come on. Um, it, it, one thing it is uh, good to know is that a lot of, our tre of these trees are highly adaptable and they can grow um, fairly well in a number of these landscapes that we put them into. Uh, but um, it's always got them on the edge. In other words, they're growing, but they're always on the threshold of potential disaster because it's not the soil they grow in. The soils under, on these mountainsides are also relatively acidic. So the pH of the soil is relatively low, somewhere around 5, sometimes pH of 4. So we're getting really acidic soils here. And yet our clay soils that we have here in Ohio are relatively basic. We're looking at 6.5, 7, 7.5, sometimes upwards of 8 in pH. And so you're thinking, well, it goes from 6.5 to 8. That's 1.5. With big wood. You have to understand the pH scale. The pH scale is logarithmic. And so a change of one unit is a 10 times fold change in acidity. If you go two units from 6 to 8, you're looking at a 100 fold change in basicity versus acidity. And so uh, that pH is very important to our plants. And again, they're very well adapted to that, that kind of environment. They're adapted to a cold uh, environment. So winter kill really isn't a problem with them most of the time. However, we do have to understand that they can get wind burnt. If they're exposed um, without any protection, they can desiccate the needles and end up with brown needles on some of these trees due to winter burn. And especially when we plant them beside <coughs> highways. When we plant them beside highways, not only do we have wind tunnels that they're standing in, but what do we put on those roads frequently in the winter? Salt. Salt. And then more currently, we have de-icer de materials. It's a saline solution that as soon as they're putting it out there, it's just floating up into the air and blowing onto the trees on either side of the road. 
and that will cause a lot of desiccation in the needles. So environmentally, we challenge our conifers. Again, they grow well in moist soils, not saturated <coughs> soils. Uh, they have to be relatively well drained, and, a, and this happened to be a flooding situation um, in that particular case. But um, even in neighborhoods, here we see probably a Norway spruce based on the pattern of branching and how the branches are dangling, but it's not a very thrifty specimen, and part of the reason is there's standing water just beneath the surface of the soil. Conifers can't deal with that. If you don't have good drainage around them, they're going to drown. They're going to lose their root system. And once you lose your root system, then the rest of the top of the tree goes. And so uh, when you see this standing there for days to weeks at a time, that's not voting well for the conifer that may be standing there, unless it might be a bald cypress. If it were a bald cypress, hey, I can deal with that. Uh, and that's what we usually end up with, is a, a <coughs> hole after the tree dies. So if you dig a hole and it fills with water overnight, you probably shouldn't put a conifer there. Um, the other thing is, um, and a lot of our newer developments, um, especially that have a major roadway that go uh, right and feed into that development, but go right by it, um, the, the uh, um, construction engineers always want to build a berm between the road and the houses to reduce some of the traffic sound. But have you ever watched them build those berms? They pile up the nastiest soil that they've dug out of everybody's foundation in the neighborhood. <coughs> and then they take this device behind a caterpillar tractor that's called a, a cloven hoof compactor. It has spikes sticking out all over it, and they run that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on that berm until it's <coughs> cement. And then they throw some grass seed over top of it, and then they say, okay, landscapers, plant trees in that. And of course, they have to get out the jackhammer just to get down through the soil. And they basically dig a bowl, and they plop it <coughs> in the that bowl has absolutely no drainage. And every time it rains, even though you're up on a hillside, it fills with water. And if it's conifers that you're putting up there, they're going to die. Uh, so we have to consider the environment that we're putting them in. Now, conifers do have relatively shallow root systems, <coughs> but not necessarily this shallow. But underneath there, you can see there's perched water there. This happens to be on a little bit of a hillside. It goes up and then flattens out and then goes down. And so there's this plateau up there, which you would think should drain, but it doesn't. And eventually all these large spruces have died because of wet feet. Occasionally this happens. You know, we've got lots and lots and lots of rain, and then windstorms come by and just pop those big conifers over because they're nothing but a big sail to capture all the wind that's coming by. And so it uproots them. You know, somebody says, well, I can fix that. I can throw a cable on that and pull it right upwards and we'll stake it in the ground and we'll be perfectly fine. Not. Not. Once you have destroyed that root system in that manner and have disrupted all of the fine roots that are necessary to keep that tree alive, they do not reestablish. Um, they do not reestablish, and eventually that tree's going to die. Um, I, I've watched for almost a decade and a half as I've driven from Ada, Ohio, down to Columbus, Ohio, on 31. Uh, there was a, there's a household there that has a number of conifers out in the front yard, and one of those was pushed over in a windstorm. And so they went out and they hauled it up with a couple of ropes, and then they tied it to two neighboring conifers. <laughs> so it's kind of that deal that the, the offspring have to suffer the uh, sins of the, the elder. Um, and uh, just this year, I finally saw them taking the ropes off of it, getting ready to cut the thing down because it was dead. Uh, so uh, you can't reposition those trees and expect them to survive. The other challenge that we run into 
Uh, we have to be very careful in our planting of our trees. Here you can see a very well established tree in the landscape, but there's still burlap around the base of that tree. When they, the, whenever the landscaper planted these trees in the, in the soil, they did not bother to take the burlap off the balls. You have to take that burlap off. That burlap does not decompose like you think it should. Because we treated that burlap with antifungal materials to prevent it from decaying. Um, and so it doesn't decay. And if there's any kind of rope, you can see there's a rope right there. Um, it's wrapping around the trunk of that tree. Uh, it's going to eventually strangle that tree as that tree continues to grow in circumference and diameter. So we have to be careful when we're planting. The other thing is, um, a, a tree should only be staked for a year. One year. If you have a tree that has to have a stake on it for more than a year, that means that tree is never going to establish in that soil. <coughs> Something's wrong there. If it doesn't establish a root system well, good enough to hold itself up within a year's time, it's not going to. And the other thing is, people just leave those on for years and years and years. And you can see the tree grew over top of the hose and the wire on this. And eventually it produced a weak point where a little bit of a wind came along and snapped it right off. So staking a tree is important, but it's also important to take that material off before it gets grown into the tissue of the tree. And then finally, before we move on here, if uh, somebody calls me to come look at this tree or this one over here and says, what can I do? <laughs> I cannot do resurrections. <laughs> this tree is already dead. It's right. the walking dead. <laughs> There's no way of bringing that tree back from the threshold of death. The only thing you can do for trees that look like this is, you know, be kind to them, take them out of their misery, cut them down, and plant something else in the hole that's left behind. Now, other and abiotic uh, planting problems, and I'll go through these very quickly. Now, this was a situation that these were new trees that had been put into a landscape, and you can see, number one, they didn't bother taking the basket off the bottom of it, which is a no-no. They left all the burlap. There's even the, the cord still around the base of the trees. But that wasn't the issue here. Um, that tree was only in the landscape for about a year and a half before it completely died, and several others as well. The diagnosis took a little bit of effort because they had to, uh, you can see there's the top of the ball, and they have a yardstick there, and they're going to measure the trunk there from the cut down to where the soil level is. So that's what they're doing here. So we're looking at about six and a half uh, inches from the soil to the top of the cut. And then they started digging the soil away from around the trunk of the tree. And there's the, that six and a half inch mark there. It's actually slipped down a little bit more. But you can see there's at least another six inches between where the soil level was and where the roots were. And these were secondary roots. This was the tree's attempt to save itself. Um, and so uh, there's you know, almost 14 inches from where those first roots came out to the top of that cut. And there was only six and a half inches of that 14 that were exposed trunk. You can't bury conifers. If you bury conifers even an inch below where they should be, you're threatening the life of that conifer. Uh, and most of this root system here is secondary roots. It wasn't the original roots of the tree. That tree was so deep in the ground that when they took the tree spade to dig it, they cut off the original root system, or it had rotted off by the time they dug the tree. Uh, you're, I think you're saying that it was bald. <laughs> it was a, a bald and burlap, so it was dug out of the field which means the nursery that was propagating them had it buried so deep in the field that it's surprising that it even survived to get to the landscape. So this went way back. Oh yeah. <coughs> and this is, a, this is one of the things that we are discovering uh, is that there was a lot of bad things, a lot of sins went on in the nursery 
years ago. And that carried over <coughs> into the landscape for another several years. And so it took probably nearly 10 to 15 years for that sin to finally catch up to that tree and kill it. And that's what we run into the in, in the landscape. Well, it's been growing there. Well, kind of growing. It's been growing there for a decade. And it just died. Well, it's been dying slowly all of those years. So we have to be very careful. When that tree came to the, the site, that ball should have been torn apart. They should have dug down the that soil until they found the root system. And that should have been the level at which it was planted in the ground. So you can correct for that problem to some extent. You can correct when you're planting it. Yeah. But once it's in the ground, forget it. It's not going to be resurrectable. You're not going to be able to pull it up out of the ground and reestablish it at a correct level. So there was the original um, ball depth hmm. compared to what the tree should have been. Here's another thing. When you see a, a tree planted in the soil, and the branches are coming up out of the soil, feet away from the base of the tree, that should tell you something's not right here. Uh, conifers don't grow their branches up to the soil. And so that's, a, a, again, a signal that things aren't right. And when you have soil, or even mulch, volcano mulching, ugh. Mulch is great, like if you use it properly. But if you're volcano mulching up the trunk of the tree, or have soil buried up on against the base of that tree, that's making all kinds of nasty going on on the bark of that tree. Um, so you know, planting depth, mulch depth, soil depth, it's all critically important. Now here's the taxes. That there's the top of the, the ball, or where it should have been. Look how much soil was piled up on top of that. Now, what, did it come in the ball that way, or was this after it was planted on site where they just, well, let's prop it up by putting more soil up around the base of the trunk? Not a good thing to do. And then, this is another malady that we can run into in nursery-produced plants. Uh, this plant had apparently been in a small container for too long a period of time, <coughs> and it trained the roots to grow in circles. And then they could have most likely taken it out of that original small pot and planted it into a bigger pot, but they didn't correct the root problem to begin with. And so it's, it started out bad and just got worse from there. All right, so um, the other thing that we can encounter are diseases and insects that attack our conifers. And that's probably what you think you have going on with your conifer. Well, maybe it is. But then on the other hand, maybe it's one of these environmental things that we can't really deal with once it's established in the landscape. We deal with what is called the disease triangle. And we have to remember that the disease-causing organism is a biological organism as well. And it has specific parameters under which it can grow and thrive. The plant, the host plant, also a biological organism, has a, 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 optimum conditions under which it will grow and thrive. And so that environment of this disease triangle can be both the environment for the pathogen as well as the environment for the host plant that can be negative or positive either way. So environment, just what I was going over all of those other things previously, um, can be very critical in as to whether a tree is susceptible to a disease or not, or at least those that are very basic and very poorly drained and very saturated. And environment, environment, environment. Now the other thing is, um, you know, when we talk about the Colorado blue spruce, everybody loves the blue spruce unless you have to mow around it. Um, everybody loves the Colorado blue spruce because of its really unique appearance in the landscape. That pale, ghostly, grayish blue coloration is to die for when it's growing well. And initially when we plant it into our urban landscapes, it does grow pretty well. But remember, that urban landscape is usually 
pretty tiny landscape. And that big tree, which can get 60 to 120 feet in height, needs as much soil underneath it to support that growth on the top. But if it's confined to a little two and a half foot square, it's not going to be able to support itself in the top. And eventually it's going to re reach a threshold that says, you're not going to grow. And you're going to progressively start to die. And that's when our beautiful mature tree starts failing. And that's when we start scrambling, oh, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it is it not in the environment that it should be in. Um, so we have the tribal <coughs> environment plays a huge role. Uh, the pathogens, the pathogens are always there. They're just common in our landscapes. <coughs> and then for the disease to establish, it has to have its optimal environmental conditions. The pathogen's always there. And then we have, we have a host that's susceptible. And we can take a resistant host <coughs> and eventually make it susceptible mm -hmm. by placing it in the wrong environment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so these are all the things of factors that we have to consider. Right now, one of the things that you may be seeing quite a bit of is large spruces <coughs> that are dropping their needles, typically from the bottom upwards. One of the potential causes of that is this fungal disease <coughs> called Rhizosphaeria needlecast. And this is a fungus that produces spores. The spores float on the air, so everywhere the wind blows, these spores are going to be here. Then, what can you tell me about that planting arrangement? Crowded. How's that? Crowded. Crowded, absolutely. Um, but when this planting was first put in, it was probably little trees. That only had about a two-foot diameter on them. And there was about eight feet between each tree in this line when it was initially planted. Oh, this is going to be perfect for about <coughs> 15 years. In about 15 years, both of those trees are growing toward one another. And eventually they become intertwined with one another. And one of the things that spruces don't like is shade. They don't like competition. They can't survive with shading. So once these trees started growing into one another, they started shading one another, and they started putting stress on one another. And then they became more susceptible to disease. The other thing, when you have them planted this closely, why do you think they planted them more closely to begin with? Windbreak. Windbreak, absolutely. We want a wind break instantly. So let's plant them two feet apart. Now I've seen that. Trees two feet apart because they wanted a wind break tomorrow. <laughs> and they do produce a nice wind break for a short period of time. Then they start competing with one another. And um, that wind break, once they get big enough to prevent the wind from blowing through them, it will change the environment for the trees as well as the people standing on the other side of the wind group. It's preventing wind from drying the needles off very quickly. And the needles stay wetter and wetter, longer and longer into the day. And when you look at pathogens of the conifers, one of the things with, that is necessary is leaf wetness. Hours of leaf wetness. And the more crowded these trees become, the longer that leaf wetness is retained. So close planting is a no-no for our spruce trees. Even though we think it's great for a weed break, which it is for a short time, it's bad eventually for the trees, yes? So in a natural environment, the mountains, they, they would thin themselves out? They naturally thin naturally. themselves. Okay. Yep. And uh, with, with the needle cast disease, it typically hits the older needles, or it shows up mostly on the older needles. You see the browning out, and eventually those needles can turn a purplish coloration, uh, and uh, they will fall off. 
So all that you're left with on a number of these branches are the newest growth, because the new growth hasn't been infected yet. The old growth is infected, the needles die, and they fall off. So you get these very, very thin canopy trees. And ultimately, the, even the new growth can't keep up because the evergreens retain needles because they need them to function appropriately for several years in a row. If you start taking those older needles out prematurely, you're putting stress on the tree. And it's going to become more susceptible to the disease. Things that favor rhizosphaeria um, uh, it includes plant selection. We'll look at that here in a second. Needle wetness, how long do they stay wet, and poor air circulation. And so when we're planting these conifers into windbreaks or privacy fences or whatever you want to call it, it's going to favor that. Unfortunately, Colorado blue spruce is most susceptible. Engelman spruce is almost as susceptible. White spruce is moderately susceptible, and Norway spruce is probably the least susceptible to rhizosphere. And that's why we will tend to recommend Norway if you want one of these big spruces more than the blue spruce or the, the uh, uh, white spruce. Um, Christmas tree plantations deal with this all the time. Now, we're getting to experience it more in the landscape because of the crowdedness that the uh, trees are being planted in. Now here, now that's a little bit of an overkill in the number of spruce trees. They want to forest instantly. Um, and that's not going to be good for those trees in the future. Right now they're growing fine because there's still air circulation through there. But as soon as they get big enough, such as these, they're eventually going to start growing into one another and reducing air circulation. Mm -hmm. This is the best environment for a blue spruce, a solitary specimen out in the middle of the yard. Good air circulation, good exposure to the sun, hopefully good drainage on it. It will thrive. And of course, we do see them thriving all over Ohio. And then you ask, why mine? Why is mine dying? Why isn't his dying? I don't like him. Why doesn't his die? <laughs> um, well, it, it's the environment of your tree. And the other thing that we have to remember are these, all of these trees are individuals. They're not genetically identical. And just like a human population, there's a bell curve in that population. Most of us fall in the middle. We're moderately resistant. Some of us are at the extreme resistant end. Throw anything at me. And then there's the other part of the population that you look at them sideways and they die. So just like humans, the trees are individuals. Unless they have been genetically, uh, vegetatively propagated, they're going to be different. All right, and then, of course, where they're planted, if it's not a windbreak, um, if you have other deciduous trees competing with them, that too will favor the development of rhizosphere at the base of the trees. And it will progressively creep up that tree as circulation is cut off and cut off and cut off more. Um, they do produce spores on the needles. Um, you can't really 100% verify this in the field. This is something that needs to be sent to a lab to be verified. And that's where our pest diagnostic clinic comes in um, at Ohio Department of Agriculture. If you want to try to spray this out of your trees, you're in for the long haul. It's going to be at least three years in a row of spraying those trees at least twice a year, maybe three times a year with a fungicide to reduce the incidence of this disease. Part of the problem is the infection occurs up here in May, June, and July, and then if it's real wet in August, it may occur again in August and September, but the symptoms don't start showing up till the following year. And then by the time you see the symptoms the following year, you've already gone through inoculation again in May, June, August, and September. And then those symptoms show up the year after that. So if you're, you're always one step behind when you first start your spraying program. You may have to spray twice in the spring and once in August. And then repeat that one, two, three, sometimes four years in a row 
to interrupt that disease cycle. We're talking money and lots of it. All right, um, I've gone on too, too long here. Um, uh, we'll cover at least one insect here. It, this is my favorite, the bagworm. <laughs> Anybody know what the bagworm is? <laughs> uh, it is a moth, it's a caterpillar. And people confuse the true bagworm with things like tent caterpillars and fall uh, webworms and a few other species. Um, there's one generation a year, it's over there right now, uh, overwintering in the bags of the females that are hanging on the trees. Uh, and they do have a huge list of species that they feed on, not just conifers, although they love conifers. They also feed quite extensively on a number of deciduous trees. And they, and they are a defoliator as a caterpillar, and they form a spindle-shaped bag around themselves when they're developing. That tree was killed by bagworm. They can absolutely kill your trees. Um, the problem is people don't recognize them when they're on the tree, especially a conifer. They look at that and say, aren't those the cones of the tree? <laughs> no, they're not. That's the insect that's eating the needles off of those branches. And so when you take one of those bags off and cut it open, right now at this time of year, if you get a female bag, which is about 50% of the bags on the tree, you may find this pupil case on the interior of that bag. And that's the dead female right there. Um, once she lays her eggs, she just kind of dries up and blows away. Uh, but that's her pupil case. And inside of that pupil case, are where her eggs are overwintering right now on that tree. Those eggs were laid in September, and they will not hatch until June next year. Yeah, you got to understand the biology of the organism that you're dealing with. So they're hanging on there for nearly nine months, case, and then in June they begin hatching. And you see all these little caterpillars streaming down out of the bag there. Okay. And they're ugly little caterpillars. <laughs> I mean, they are ugly little caterpillars. Maybe that's why they build a bag around themselves. <laughs> In fact, they start building that bag as soon as they land on something that they can eat. And so here you can see very young, first in star caterpillars of the bagworm. And they've already got little bags built around their bodies. They're so small that they can't eat the entire needle. They actually mine the interior of the needle when they first start feeding. So you have to really look closely for them when they first hatch. And as they get a little bit older, um, they get into what we call the dunce cap stage. And you can see they're big enough to chew, chew off a little bit bigger pieces of the foliage that they're feeding on. Happens to be arborvitae in this case. As they get older, then they start dangling down because they're getting a little bit heavy and they're eating more of the needles. See, you can, they can strip branches of spruce trees bare. Arborvitae, they love arborvitae. If they hit arborvitae, you have one chance. If they defoliate an arborvitae, it's dead. There's no coming back from that, from arborvitae. So here's a couple. Now that one happens to be in a cemetery. Yeah, maybe it's foretelling its future. <laughs> uh, there's one oops, uh, in somebody's driveway. They, they drive past this every single day, and they don't see this. I drive down the road at 55 miles an hour. <laughs> My girls love it. <laughs> Especially when they get in the car and they say, Dad, there's something moving in this bag. I'm not going to ride this car. And you can see they can defoliate. Um, here you can see the older caterpillar, lots of foliage incorporated in the bag. Now it's, it's, it's like a lic licorice stick to it, no, 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 straight down. And you can see they can do huge damage. That's a large spruce tree, and they're devouring it. Arborvitae, they can strip the foliage off. You know, that's, that's another goner there. Well, I should back off. This one actually did refoliate the next year. So it is possible, but they cut it down before they gave it a chance to continue to grow. Um, so 
Now there's the what the, the caterpillar looks like when it's big, still ugly. Um, and then when it's done feeding, about August, it ties itself off to the branch. And this thing that I've been calling a bag isn't really a bag, it's a tube. At the front end, where the head's sticking out, that's the feeding end. Out the tail end, that's the poop chute. Now that's where all the excrement has been leaving the bag. Now once it ties off, it flips upside down and sticks its head down toward the poop chute. And then it pupates inside the bag. Female pupae, male pupae, quite a difference in size. Uh, in fact, when you look at the male pupae, you can see legs, you can see wings, you can see antennae. You look at the female, you don't see any of that. You'll see why here in a second. If they survive the pupation period, there are a number of parasitoids that will attack them, but usually they don't do a good enough job to prevent them from defoliating. The adult male will emerge as a moth. There's his pupil case that he dragged out of the bag with him. Not very big, that's my knuckle, so he's sitting right there. Uh, big antennae, and moths have big antennae because they find their females by calling pheromones, called sex pheromones. We call it Chanel number five. <laughs> but uh, you can see the big antennae for finding the female. Um, this is a moth. And moths and butterflies typically have scales on their wings. He has very little scale covering his wings. This is the female. That's the female adult. Yeah, that's the female adult. And if you pull her out of that case prematurely, that's what she looks like. She stays worm-like even as an adult. She never naturally leaves that pupil case for anything except to die. So she is not much more than a big ovary filled with eggs, waiting to lay those eggs. Here we found, I found this, this particular scenario, and there's a little male, and he's hanging out the bottom of the bag, and I'm thinking, boy, he didn't do so well getting out of the bag, and then it's like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe he did get out of his bag. And I cut the bag open, and he was mating the female through the bottom of the bag. He found her by following her chemical scent to her bag, and then he backed his tail end in her bag between her pupil case and her body and mated her without ever seeing her. <laughs> Yeah, well, a blind date. A little voyeuristic here. <laughs> a blind date. Very good. I'll have to that. <laughs> and then, once she is mated, she lays the eggs back in to start the cycle over. Um, now, there was a couple of very critical things that I, that I mentioned there. And one is um, that the eggs are protected inside of the bag, inside of her pupil case. To attempt to spray that with an insecticide, waste of time. You have to catch them while they're feeding. And so when there's, oh yeah, sometimes they seem unstoppable. <laughs> sometimes oh all you can do is throw your hands up in the air. <laughs> Hand picking is one method. If it's a small enough plant, you can pick the bags off. Or you may have to cut them off, because that silk is in incredibly strong. In fact, those bags can hang on a plant for up to three years before that silk will break. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, if that branch is still growing, it's going to be strangled by that silk. So I take little um, uh, pinking shears or, or cuticle scissors and clip them off with the cuticle scissors. Biological control? Yeah, so-so. Bacillus thuringiensis, that's VT. That's a bacterium that will kill caterpillars. Um, and if you catch them young enough, it is very effective. If you wait too long, then you have to resort to standard chemicals. Uh, and so management, um, if you wait until July, end of July, beginning of August, before you notice that your plant's disappearing to the backwards, you have to use one of these chemicals um, to do any effective control. If you catch them in that June period, the Psyllis is very effective, but timing is everything.
so, tree committee, do I go on or do I cut it at this point? Oh, I think we're fine. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Salted much. Um, so that beautiful Austrian pine that I had shown at the beginning of the program, beautiful pyramidal shape, foliage from the top to the bottom. It was just reaching the age that it becomes susceptible to this disease. What it, age is that? About 15 to 20 years old. And if you think about it, now, Austrian pine, which is the, the one that is one of the most susceptible, um, we encouraged it to be planted everywhere. We see it as windbreaks, we see it along highways, we see it in landscapes, we see it in uh, commercial landscaping, in malls, in industrial buildings, in office buildings. They look beautiful for about 15 to 20 years. And then they became susceptible to this disease. That's the other tricky thing, is your plant can be resistant for a number of years in its early stages. And then when it hits about reproductive age, it suddenly becomes susceptible. And that's what we found out with Diplodia tip-like. Now, it is another fungal disease. Um, it, it's increasing in landscape. Well, actually, right now, it's starting to decrease because so many Austrian pines have died off and have been taken out. Um, it hits all the two needled pines, Austrian pine, Scots pine, red pine, um, mugo pine. Uh, it'll also hit ponderosa pine. And I haven't really seen it on white pine, but some of the fact sheets tell us that it does in other areas of the country. But Austrian pine and Scots pine are extremely susceptible. Now, the pathogen overwinters as spores on the trees. Springtime spreads the spores right when the new candles are beginning to expand, and that's the susceptible tissue of the tree is that new growth. Um, it begins as a tip light, but can spread into a canker back on the branches, and it's a progressive disease that will usually start at the bottom of the tree and work its way upwards. Leaf wetness, once again, is critical. So here we see a windbreak, and the one in the middle, not looking so good. As we get closer, we can see the symptomology is very stereotypic of Diplodia tip light, and this is the real telltale symptom. Um, when that new candle only partially expands, those little needles sticking out there are like sewing needles sharp. They are incredibly sharp. It started in that candle and worked its way back into the branch. So there's an early infection on Austrian pine. This is Scots pine. Scots pine can really be horrendously hit by Diplodia. Um, and it can also produce a stem canker, and it's a bleeding canker where sap just oozes out of the branches. Now, that's one thing I should emphasize. Pines don't naturally expel sap. That is a defensive measure. Something has broken down the barrier between the outside world and the inside world of that tree. Uh, here, the, the, the canker occurred in the main trunk and killed everything from that point upwards in the tree. And there's the canker, in, in a, what I mean by canker is the point of infection, where it's rampantly growing and developing. And there's, um, down in the bases of those really short needles are where the spores get produced for the next generation. It can also produce those spores on the cones. And this cone that looks like it's been sprinkled with pepper is the spores of that infection that are going to spread to the next one. Um, how do we manage Diplodia tip light? Well, we try to avoid planting susceptible plants, which means we don't plant Austrian pine anymore, or we shouldn't. Or if we do plant Austrian pine, put it out in the open where it will dry off quickly every day. Otherwise, it's going to incur this disease. If you plant it around the pond, where does everybody have Austrian pine? Around their pond to prevent the leaves from the deciduous trees from blowing into your pond. Well, that's just setting it up for a scenario of moisture coming out of that pond every day, keeping those needles wet 
for hours into the day. Um, if you have a, a really infected Austrian pine, don't leave it stand there. Now, it doesn't need to be the typhoid Mary that's giving its disease to everybody around it. Cull it, get it out, remove it from the landscape. Sanitation, sanitation. Fungicide treatments, eh. The timing is so critical on this that nobody hits it right. So I don't really recommend fungicide treatments. What is sanitation? Clean up everything. If you have a dead branch on the tree, cut that branch off at the trunk. Get it off the property. Burn it, send it to the municipal waste, but get it out of there. Needles on the ground, clean them up, get them out of there. Pine cones on the ground, clean them up, get them out of there, because those are all sources of inoculum that can infect the next tree. Now, that kind of defeats some of the beauty of having pine trees, because what do we love other than to walk under a grove of pine trees and just have all those beautiful needles laying on the ground. So you have to balance that uh, need between sanitation to manage the disease, if the disease is there, and the aesthetic value that you get from those needles. All right, well, um, an insect again, white pine weevil. What do you think white pine weevil infests? <laughs> Pines. But it also hits spruces. It also hits firs. So the name is deceiving in this particular case here. There are a number of different conifers that it can impact, including Douglas fir. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of hosts of this particular insect. Its activity starts very early in the season. The adults overwinter in the needles underneath the tree. And as soon as it warms up to about 50 degrees, they start working their way up the tree to the very terminal growth at the top. And the females will start chewing holes into that terminal growth. Break that barrier, resin starts flowing out of that. And so very early in the spring, if you're looking at the tops of your conifers and see glistening, clear sap running down the terminal growth, you've got problems potentially this white pine weevil. And here you can see the top terminal growth has been destroyed in that pine. There's a spruce where the top terminal growth has been destroyed. I see this everywhere, and people don't know what it is. And they don't correct it. Now, um, you see the end results on a number of these trees when later in their life they're double trunked because you lost that terminal growth at some time. Uh, here, now you can see they started from the top. This happens to be a Christmas tree plantation, uh, but I can see this in the landscape as well. They started in the terminal growth up here. They ate, they laid their eggs in the terminal growth, and the larvae chewed their way down through one, two, three, almost four worlds into that tree. Destroyed all four worlds of branches. That tree is shot as a Christmas tree. It would be shot as a landscape tree. Um, here's a, a big white or white spruce where again several worlds of branches have been destroyed by the larvae and the larvae feed just underneath the bark of that tree. Um, they're little white legless larvae. Um, they score along the, the uh, trunk of the plant and then eventually they dig chambers in which they pupate. One of the methods for managing them is just prune that infested growth out. But you can't just throw it on the ground. You gotta burn it, you gotta get rid of it, you gotta send it off the property. Otherwise, they'll finish their development even in the clipped off part. Um, there are good insecticides that can manage this insect. Systemic insecticides. Insecticides that you apply to the root system, the tree takes it up to the terminal growth and will protect it well against white pine weevil. Um, they're called the neonicotinoids, and one of the most common ones is Bayer's Advanced Merit. Um, and unfortunately, that's got some real challenges when it comes to pollinators. Yes. Because it can potentially show up in pollen in flowering plants. So conifers we don't worry about, because bees have nothing to do with conifers. But if you have a garden nearby, you make sure you don't treat the plants in the garden. 
Uh, Dothystroma. Uh, let's see. I'll do Dothystroma and Cytospora, and I'll, I'll have to stop here. I could go on all night. <laughs> but uh, Dothystroma is a, a needle blight that is actually becoming more prevalent than the Diplodia tip blight on Austrian ponds. Um, it infects the needles. It just, well, it already went through infection for this year, but the symptoms start showing up during the winter and early next spring. And in fact, a lot of the pines along highways that people think, well, that's just salt injury. It's probably this dothy stroma that's affecting them. Uh, and when we take a look at the needles, uh, notice that the, the ends of the needles are all brown, and then you hit this reddish spot in the middle of the needle, and then from that spot in, it's green. So it kind of gives a halo effect on the branches of the trees. Brown to the tips, green to the branch. Uh, and you can see new growth out here in the front. And that's one of the deceptors in this particular disease cycle, is it takes two years, one season to infect, one season for the symptoms to show up. They show up in the spring, and then we pop out new growth. And that new growth hides the symptoms. So it just keeps on infecting. Symptoms show up in the winter, new growth in the spring, hides the symptoms. Uh, so it's, it's a, becoming very prevalent in the two needle pines. And there's those dark brown spots are where the spores of the disease infected the needle. And then from that point outwards, the needle dies. There's been a few cases where it shows up in spruce trees, but this is a very special situation. It's in a nursery. And the nursery has this big plantation of spruce trees, but they have a windbreak of Austrian pine right next to the spruce. Mm -hmm. That is highly infected with Dothystroma. Mm -hmm. And the spores just piled into the spruce trees and overwhelmed the spruce mm -hmm. trees, and they got Dothystroma as well. So under certain situations, you can force the issue. Um, management, you can spray them with fungicides. This is probably one of the easier of the needle diseases to manage with fungicides compared to any of the other diseases. Um, and it's some pretty readily available old fungicides that have been around for a long time. Um, and then Zimmerman pine moth. This is kind of a, an odd little moth. It's a borer. It bores underneath the bark of the, the pine trees. And Scots pine and Austrian pine are really favored hosts for this particular caterpillar. Uh, and one of their telltale signs is these big globs of resin hanging on the trunks of the tree. Looks like somebody's taken a candle and just melted wax in a big pile. Um, and when you look real close at that resin, you can see red speckles all through it. That's the caterpillar poop mixed in with the resin. Uh, if you see the resin masses without that red pepper, not Zimmerman pine moth. But if that red pepperish material is there, it's Zimmerman pine moth. And it's a little caterpillar. It has a really weird life cycle. It hatches out in August. It feeds on needles of the pine in the month of August, and maybe into September. Then as a second instar larva, it goes back the branch and hides under the bark till the following spring when it comes back out. But instead of going to the needles, it goes back to the trunk to the branch collars. That's where it bores in. And it feeds all around that branch collar. And when it does that, it weakens that junction. So you get a little snow load on that branch, snaps up. You get a little wind on that branch, snaps off. And I see this all along highways where those big Austrian pines, you see half the branches are all you know, broken and laying over. And I can almost guarantee you it's Zimmerman pine moth. So there's what it looks like when you're looking at those branch whorls. Big gobs of resin hanging underneath there. And then the branch easily breaks at those junctions. 
Insecticide sprays, um, if you can catch that young larva in that August time frame, you can, you can eliminate it. But that's about the only thing you can really do effectively. You might do a spray in the springtime, but again, timing is everything. And then, uh, again, look at all that resin up there. But it's not always Zimmerman pine moth that causes resin flows on pines. Look at that pattern on there. Lines and lines and lines and lines of holes. Yellow-bellied sapsucker. That's a woodpecker. And here's one that has Zimmerman pine moth and a woodpecker. <laughs> Again, you have to have that red uh, uh, stuff in there. There's the little woodpecker. Um, it hits all kinds of plants, including deciduous shrubs. Uh, but they can do a, a huge number on the trees. Usually it doesn't lead to death of the tree, but it certainly looks, makes it look nasty. And here's one where the yellow-bellied sapsucker caused the initial injury, and then the Zimmerman pine moth came into the holes made by the, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. All right. Uh, uh, pine wilt nematode. Now uh, this is kind of a new one here. Uh, and it hits all of the two-needled pines, but it's not necessarily seen in um, uh, white pine. Uh, it's a, an animal that gets introduced into the vascular tissue of the pines, and in their development, it clogs the vascular tissue, and suddenly the pine just collapses. Uh, and I've seen this occasionally. The nematode is not transferred in the air, it's not transferred through the roots. It's not transferred through root grafts. It's carried by a beetle. And the, the beetle's called a sawyer beetle. And it feeds on branches. And it emerges out of dead wood of pine with the nematodes in its mouth. And then it introduces it into the new tissue of the branches. Um, so there's the, the uh, bore in the wood of a dead tree. And then it goes from the, the dead wood, it emerges as adult, feeds on the branches, introduces the nematode, and the nematode um, increases in number and clogs the, the tissue. Side by side trees. One's been killed by the nematode, one's perfectly fine. Uh, so um, it's a really, this, you know, in the springtime, this looked like an absolutely beautiful, normal pine tree. By midsummer, it was dead and brown. That's how fast this can work. Uh, can you do anything about it? No. All you can do is when you have a dead tree, get it out of there. Sanitation. Hopefully remove it before the longhorn beetle can transfer the nematode from the dead tree to a living tree. It's one to be aware of, basically, is what I'm saying. And it's not going to spread itself between neighboring trees. It has to be carried by the beetle. All right, I am going to stop there. Obviously gone over time. Um, are there anything that you have a question about that I haven't had time to touch on? Is it possible to contact you if we have a specific question or send you a picture and say, what does it look like or something like that? Um, you can do that. Um, and my uh, email address is very easy. Young, period, the number two, at osu.edu. Young, period, two. How I ever got the number two with the last name of Young at Ohio State. <laughs> I know why. I was a graduate student there when they first started handing out email addresses. <laughs> that was it. And it stayed with me from graduate school into employment with them. Okay. And I had jobs in between. <laughs> so I, it, I did maintain them. Young period two. Most of the time if you hear somebody with Smith or Young or... Yeah, some other real common name like Brown, it's 1,215. <laughs> A young period, too. Any other questions? I see you have some marble pie there. <laughs> I think everybody's curious about why our pine trees are dying out, what we call the pine forest in Glen Helen. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at those. No, I have so not. They're old. They're old. But they did not recede, and they're not, they're not regrowing. Well, once again, remember, uh, this, is, there, this is not their native habitat. Uh -huh. 
and, and then reseeding is probably not going to occur yeah. in this habitat. And then they're ringed by hemlocks, I think. Is that right? What? Yeah. The, hemlo the, the hemlocks. The hemlocks are looking fine? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, go through here very quickly. And so somebody would correct me on that. I think it's hemlock. Where? Around the, uh, the pine trees out of the pine forest? There are some there. Yeah. yeah. This could be what we're dealing with, armillaria root rot. It's a fungal disease. Yeah. Um, so that mushroom at the base of the, the tree, um, again, it's going to cause the degradation of the root system. And as soon as you kill the root system, the rest of the tree is going to die. Um, and armillaria is very common in Ohio. Uh, and when you see uh, a dying or dead conifer with these mushrooms growing around the base, that's an indicator. Uh, and the other thing is, um, they may, once the tree is dead, if the bark comes off the tree and you see these shoestring like fungus, is the shoestring fungus. Um, that's the, um, ex and they're called rhizomorphs. And that's where the fungus spreads up the trunk of the tree. So it could be armillaria root rot, is what you're dealing with. And believe it or not, the largest organism alive today is a fungus. It's an armillaria. Mm -hmm. And it covers 3,000 some acres of forest. One, or one organism. Um, How do they know it's just one organism? Yeah. They sampled the DNA on that side of the infe infection and sampled the, the DNA on the opposite side of the infection, and it was genetically identical. Where is it? Uh, there's one up in Michigan, there's another one out in Oregon, and there might be one in, in uh, Montana. Mm. Yeah. They're huge. Absolutely phenomenally huge. So I, I would suspect, I'm not going to guarantee, but okay. I would suspect that you might have armillaria. Mm. Is there a defense against that type of uh, fungus? Nope. <laughs> Healthy trees. <laughs> And how healthy are our trees growing in the habitat that don't belong in? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? You recommend the book on how to grow trees? I'm sorry? Can you recommend the book on conifer trees? Oh, on conifers? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I have two very large books that I have as references for insects of trees and shrubs, which includes the conifers. Um, it's a Cornell publication, um, and that's the title, Insects That Feed on Trees and Shrubs, <laughs> or Infest Trees and Shrubs. Um, uh, uh, Lyon and Johnson, I think, are the authors. It, um, it's a, a big reference. Master Gardeners typically have them uh, as one of their reference books. And the other one is by one of those same authors, also a Cornell publication, that's Diseases of Trees and Shrubs. Um, it's Sinclair and Johnson, or Sinclair and Lyon, I forget which of the two authors. Um, and same type of publication, beautiful pictures in it, lots of background material. I use the disease one as a prop underneath my desk so it doesn't rock. Um, and I use the insect one regularly. And, and the way I say that is because the diseases are incredibly difficult to field diagnose incredibly difficult. So you almost have to send it to a lab. Hmm. What should we tell our clients here in Yellow Springs who ask the tree committee to plant a conifer for them? Somewhere? Well, um, obviously, whenever you're looking at conifers, um, number one, you've got to be careful of monoculture. You've got to be careful of site, where it's going to be planted. Most of these spruces and pines need wide open space. Um, and uh, Norway spruce is probably one of our more resilient spruces. It actually produces a beautiful tree. It's not going to be dense and compact like the blue spruce. It's going to be more lanky. Um, and I was just watching all the Norway spruces as I was driving down this evening. Um, and the, the, the mature ones, the majestic ones, are just fabulous. These long, pendulous branches with 
you know, almost like pom-poms hanging down from them. They make a, a beautiful structure from a distance. Um, they're, they're may not have that, they don't have the blue coloration that the blue spruce does, but it's going to be a longer live tree. Uh, for pines, again, it depends on the site. Um, there are some other species of pine other than Scots and Austrian. Uh, there are some red pines. Uh, there are some non-native pines. Uh, there's one called uh, uh, Swiss stone pine, a little bit more dense pine. But I've only seen that further north in Michigan. I haven't really seen it planted down this way. Uh, so it depends on the site quite a bit. Um, but if it's our standard clay saturated soils, Don Redwood, Bald Cypress, Maybe ginkgo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ginkgo. 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 Yeah, but, but not the female, right? Uh, well, there's yeah. a trick. Because <laughs> they smell terrible. Um, it, it, just a short time. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who have not experienced a female ginkgo, <laughs> the, the uh, quote unquote fruit that she produces, when it lands on the ground and begins to rot, it smells like puke. Because as it rots, it releases the organic acid, butyric acid. And butyric acid is the acid that comes up in vomit that makes it smell like vomit. Wow. And why is that? Is, is that some it's is just there a the, reason? It, it's just the compounds when they break down. If one of their breakdown products is butyric acid. It may deter herbivory. It may protect the seeds for a short period of time. Um, amazingly, the the uh, uh, a number of Oriental populations love the seed of ginkgo, <laughs> and they will collect them. Now, they don't eat the fleshy material on the outside. They break, they break the seed open for the meat on the interior of the seed. Um, now, you do also have to be careful with those quote-unquote fruits because they have an oil that accumulates on their surface called urecherol. Poison ivy. Poison ivy. So you can get a poison ivy rash from picking up those fruits. And the other interesting thing is only humans react to that chemical. No, no other animals. But we're animals. But we're the only animals that react to that chemical. You know, dogs can run through it, cats can roll in it, horses can eat it as they're walking along, and none of them get the rash. But humans do. Other questions? Yes. Uh, cedar rust. Yep. A red cedar on on general. Yeah. Affects some, doesn't affect others. Oh, okay. The, the question is, um, we, we have cedar apple rust, and that's the rust you're specifically asking for, and that fungal disease is an obligate by host disease. It does one part of its life cycle on juniper, eastern red cedar. And when it produces the spores on eastern red cedar, it cannot reinfect the cedar. It is obligatory to go to a rose family plant, which is apple. And there it finishes its other half of its life cycle on the leaves of apple and sometimes on the fruit of apple. And when it produces the spores on the apple, it obligatorily has to go back to juniper. It can't reinfect the same plant. It has to go back and forth. So your question was, that you posed, why do some apple trees have a terrible time with it, and why do other apple trees not? And it's all resistance breeding. They have, they have found genes that are resistant to the fungus and bred that into our newer cultivars of apples. It can affect yellow delicious, which is a good pollinator, but not red delicious or low dye or something like yep. yeah. yep. It's all genetic resistance. I mean, I've read about it and they said cut 
got the junipers and the red cedars in a five mile radius. There used to be lots. <laughs> there used to be lots. Yeah. That you, when it, when orchards were huge across Ohio, there were laws that said any wild juniper must be destroyed mm -hmm. to prevent that cycle of apple cedar rust. Yeah. Now those laws have no longer exist. Um, and nobody cares that much anymore because most of our modern cultivars of apples are resistant to the fungus. Mm -hmm. As well as they're sprayed daylights out of occasionally with, with different fungicides for other fungal diseases right. that take care of the <laughs> apple seed or rust as well. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank oh, you. That was an excellent day after this. Just wonderful. Uh, cider and cookies and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we're asking questions.